Jason. Yeah, yeah. Tenure. But they've got a <laughs> chancer coming in now, don't they? They do. Uh, one is just our junior farmer. Okay, good. <clears throat> that, that comes in handy. Yeah. Nice to be able to keep the ship going. Yeah, and, and not only decisions. that, you weren't part of the decision to keep the other ones. So <laughs> no, I wasn't. I came in after. Yeah. So I don't have any of that baggage. Which is actually pretty handy. Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, probably be more people coming in. I'm Danny Wyatt, the uh, coordinator of this campus. Brand new. We opened uh, about seven months ago. So it still has a brand new feel to it. Um, we've got Don Donovan uh, Preza here. He's from KCC, school on the other side of the island. And uh, teaches Hawaiian studies there. And he's going to be talking about this topic here. And I'll let him do the rest of the introduction because he knows himself better than I do. Okay? Thank, thank you very you. much. <clears throat> so the title of my presentation today is Taking Ownership of Ownership. And this is a play on the idea that Hawaii's transition to private property in 1840 came from somewhere else. You know? it's my, I don't have what I would say is the normal or the dominant perspective on the, on the Mahale. You know, my perspective is very different uh, than others. And it comes from <clears throat> reading thousands and thousands of archival primary source uh, documents. So that's what my, my uh, presentation is a play of, taking ownership of ownership and trying to get Hawaiians to realize that our ancestors laid a foundation that most of the stuff we're fighting for in courts today was preserved in the Hawaiian Kingdom era, right? The question that got me started on all of my research was if the missionaries were in control, like the textbooks tell us since the time they arrived in 1820, why did they have to overthrow themselves in 1893? Right? And if you start to ask yourself those kinds of basic fundamental questions and start to challenge assumptions that you may have had, you'll come to realize that, hmm, maybe they weren't in control. Right? So if they're not in control, who was in charge of the Mahedi? Yeah? So it's <clears throat> my subtitle here, Western Property Laws Assimilation into Hawaiian Property Law, because everything that was Hawaiian custom was brought forward, codified, put into law, and adapted into the Hawaiian system. Yeah. You don't have Hawaiian property law, and you don't have that in Boston, you don't have that in California, totally unique to Hawaii, right? So how are we like them if we're the unique thing? Right? There is no subject to the rights of native tenants in California. There is no subject to the rights of native tenants. The whole philosophical underlying is different. Yeah? but you have to give it a chance to be able to see that difference first. Yeah, and we'll, we'll develop that as we go through this presentation. I want you guys to think for a second how important land is to Hawaiian identity. Yeah, just think to yourself, think of things you've heard. Um, if you take it back to origin stories, Papa and Wakea talks about the beginnings uh, <clears throat> origin story, we get the malama aina metaphor from that, we get the relationship of man to kalo, we get the sibling relationship, so many different relationships for Hawaiians go back to land. And that's where for me we have to get it right. Land is that important that if your story or your perception of land is wrong, imagine what that does to your mind, to your spirit, to your soul. Right? Because this is fundamental. Man, land, Hawaiian relationship, right? Haloa, older brother, land, younger sibling. If you get that relationship wrong, or you have your understanding about how our ancestors transitioned to that wrong, that is going to affect you in ways you may not be conscious of, because land is that important to Hawaiians. Quick introduction. Before 1848, Hawaii had participated in what was Kalai Aina. Kalai, to carve Aina, the land, to carve the land. Um, the easiest <clears throat> analogy to compare this to is European feudalism. With, in the basic sense of land in exchange for service. All of the details, Europe did not have one kind of feudalism. You cannot generalize European feudalism to be one thing. There's many different variations. Right? But that basic essence, land in exchange for service, uh, was what we had. Higher rank, 
the Mo'i, the, the chief of chiefs, the king, uh, the Ali'i class, the Maka'i Nana class. Our land system was the Ahupua system. Island, districts, Ahupua, smaller. Every single piece of land had a name. A kalo patch had a name. Every single piece of land had a name. When these two systems interact, we get terms like Ali'i Ai Moku, Ali'i Ai Ahupua, the Ali'i of a, who's in charge of a Moku, the Ali'i in charge of an Ahupua, right? This is how the land and society system interact, right? This is the relationship between man and land. It was that intertwined in that sense. The higher ranking you were, the more land you got. The less rank you were, the less rank you got, right? And for me, this is an important part of our Americanization, our being raised in America where all men are created equal, right? American, American government, all men are created equal. That's not the case in a monarchy, right? In a monarchy, you put yourself under and you serve, right? If you're in the military, you understand this. You serve, you put yourself under. For those of us civilians who grew up in Hawaii, we don't get this to the degree, right? Uh, another example of this, a contemporary example. Uh, the prince, prince of Britain and the princess have a child. A million Brits are in the street to celebrate that child. President Obama has a child. A million Americans aren't going to be in the streets. There's a different reverence. There's a different... They're in a monarchy. They... America, very different, right? American, we're all equal. I'm not doing this. We're equal. I'm here. I'm not there, right? So it's... Different mindset, and that's <clears throat> part of what we've lost in my, in my perspective over the last hundred years is, is this kind of idea of that reverence. So analogy I've been using is the Mahele is like Iolani Palace. If you close your eyes and you look at Iolani Palace, describe to me what you see. Beauty. Say again, sorry. Beauty. Beauty. Does it look Hawaiian? If I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, whoa, wow, that's a cool Hawaiian palace. Probably thinking, ah, kind of European looking. That's where it came from. Right? That's where it came from. Exterior, European. Kalakao is trying to say, yes, we have palaces just like you guys. Yes, we are internationally similar in that way to you guys. If you go to the interior, describe for me what you see. Is it? What kind of what kind of staircase? What's the staircase made of? Acacia koa. Where do you got koa in, in, in Europe? The kukui. All the motifs of the interior are all Hawaiian symbology. Yeah? This is that reverse. We've all heard the coconut metaphor. We've all heard the Indian metaphor. White on the inside. You have assimilated into Western culture. Red, brown on the outside. You got the skin. You got the cocoa. You don't have. You've assimilated. You've become. For this, Iolani Palace reverses that. Exterior, to satisfy the international arena. Interior, all Hawaiian symbology. Right? On the inside, to satisfy the domestic. Because Kalakaua is getting challenged. Right? Kalakaua is not a Kamehameha. His genealogy is getting challenged. He has to fight for respect domestically. He has to fight for respect internationally. Iolani is kind of, Iolani Palace is that symbolic of those two struggles that interior domestic fight and that exterior uh, <clears throat> international. international. This is the Mahele for me. If you look at the guts of the Mahele, Hawaiian. If you look at the exterior, private property, Western. Right? Subject to the rights of native tenants, you don't have that anywhere else. The Mahele itself, you don't have that anywhere else. Not a trick question. Look in Pukui Dictionary, what does Mahele mean? To divide. Yeah? So what's being divided? Land. Yeah? For the rest of this presentation, I'd like you guys to take another perspective. Yeah? To look at, and that's the, common, that's the common answer and that's the common perspective. But to look at the division of land is to put the cart before the horse. We're looking at the results before we're looking at the how or the what. Yeah? So 
The perspective I'd like you guys to take is to understand the Mahale as a division of rights in land. As a result of dividing rights, people got land. That's when the land was divided. But you got you had rights that were divided first. As a result of that, people got land. What Mahale you pertaining to? Mahale of 1848, the general process, the general transition to private property in 1848. Who has rights in land? The people. The people. Um, Who else? The tree that you showed the Mo'i, the Ali, the Mo'i, the Ali, traditional times, all three classes. And that gets codified in the 1840 Constitution. Yeah. 1840 Constitution codifies what was Hawaiian custom, puts it into constitutional law, later those things get put into statutory law. Let's take a look. The origin of the present government and system of polity is as follows. Kamehameha I was the founder. To him belonged all the land from one end of the islands to the other. This is where you have to understand land in its layers. Land, territory of a country. Land, real estate. Land, territory of a country, land, real estate. Those of you who own a house, you still pay property taxes. You still follow zoning laws. You own your land subject to the sovereignty of the country. Right? The origin of the present to Kamehameha the First was the founder of the kingdom. To him belonged all the land. To him belonged the sovereignty. He's Kana'iaupuni. He's the unifier. He's the guy who threaded all of the four island kingdoms together. Though it was not his own private property. Now we're talking real estate. We're not talking sovereignty. No one's going to say, oh no, come over the first, you're not Kana Yaokuni. This is talking real estate. Though it was not his own private property, it belonged to the chiefs and people in common of whom Kamehameha the first was the head and had the management. This is the foundation of the Mahale. We don't have a Mahale. We don't need to divide out rights if rights weren't acknowledged in 1840. 1846, this gets put into statute. It being therefore fully established, there are but three classes of persons having vested rights in the land. First, the government. Second, the landlord. Third, the native tenants. What you have to understand at this time is Hawaii is going through huge changes. Mahale happens in 1848. Eight years prior, Hawaii has its first constitution. Hawaii moves from an absolute monarchy to the beginnings of a constitutional monarchy. So the Kamehameha III is also divesting his powers constitutionally. That creates the executive, legislative, judicial branch. That's in 1840. Eight years later, we're distributing the land, dividing the land also. <clears throat> it was not his own. The government belonged to the chiefs, the landlords, and the people in common, the native tenants. Before 1840, we don't necessarily have the concept of government because the person is the government. Absolute monarchy is the government. After 1840, you have this concept of government separate from the king. Yeah? So you have all kinds of layers being divided at this time. What did you guys do in the last eight years? Kawike only made a constitution and divided all of the real property of Hawaii. Right? That's in eight years all of this is going on. Going from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy and uh, creating private property. I did not accomplish that much in my last eight years. I don't know about you guys. <clears throat> Ralph Kuykendall talks about this. We find in the 1840 Constitution the first admission by the king and chiefs that the common people had an actual ownership interest as distinguished from a mere right of use in the lands of the kingdom. This is unique. When France transitions to private property, the king is not saying, hey, people, you guys also own the land. Yeah. Kawikeoli is unique to my knowledge in acknowledging that the people also have ownership in the real property when it came time to divide all of the real property in the country. The example that they were <clears throat> talking about in Privy Council was... Prussia. In the 1812s, Prussia did something similar and acknowledged vested right, or that the people owned the real estate. This is the beginning. This is the huge part. Right? It could have been just as easy for the king to say, my father unified all of this, the real estate is mine. 
And who's going to grumble with Kamehameha the third? Right? That's what all the other monarchs did. In Hawaii, Kawikeoli, they're acknowledged. In our system, in Hawaii, we own the real property in common with the chiefs and the people. The people were acknowledged. <clears throat> you own the whole bundle. 1840 says you own the whole bundle, not just the one bundle of stick that says you get to use land. You're part owner. That's what happens in 1840. Yeah? That is significant. That is huge. Hawaiians own the land from 1840. <clears throat> That's that line there. The common people had an actual ownership interest. The whole bundle. They didn't just have the right as distinguished from a mere right of use. Yeah. This is the beginning. This is why we need to divide out undivided interest, divide out ownership, because Hawaiian ownership was acknowledged in 1840. If I'm a missionary, I am not acknowledging three classes of people who have invested rights in land because then it gets complicated. I just say, King, you own it all, and then I just got to control one person. Right? <clears throat> So that's why he, he did that, yeah? Well, that's why he did it is coming up in two slides. So who has rights in land? First, the government. Second, the chiefs. Third, the native tenants. How do we know? Because that guy that gave the presentation said? How do we know? What documents tell us this is true? 1840 Constitution, 1846 Principles of the Land Commission, which becomes statutory law. Yeah? This is codified into law. This is something that other indigenous people elsewhere are fighting for. Right? They're all trying to get custom acknowledged. We got more than custom. We got constitutional statutory law acknowledging. That's because our ancestors were driving this process. That's the idea of taking ownership of ownership. If you realize what was preserved in here, you realize this is ours. If you think somebody else made this, it belongs to somebody else. Right? You're giving away something that belongs to you if you don't realize it was your ancestors that did this. <clears throat> 1839 Declaration of Rights, 1840 Constitution, 1846 Principles. Right? This all gets codified into law. That's the significant thing. All put into law. The rest of this presentation is an explanation of how undivided rights in land were divided. Concept of undivided rights. To use an analogy, all of these chairs are house lots. Yeah? So undivided rights means everybody in this room has a right to sit down somewhere. Undivided. When we divide out our rights, then we say, that chair is Lynette's, not mine. That chair is yours not mine. That chair is yours, not mine. We partition, we divide, we then say, this acre is mine, not yours, that acre is yours, not mine. We've divided our rights. Undivided, we all have a right to sit down somewhere. Divided, I have a right to sit down in a specific chair in this room that we've all decided on. And you have a right to sit down in a specific chair. This is the essence of the Mahale. Because there are but three classes of persons having vested rights in the land, first the government, second the chief, third the native tenants, we now have to divide out those interests. Who gets what where? What ahupua belongs to what chief? What lo'i belongs to what makainana? What belongs to who? Graphically, that's what this would look like. There are but three classes of persons. First, the government. Second, the chiefs. Third, the native tenants. All in Waianae here. Yeah. In Honolulu, in you name the Ahupua, you have three classes of persons having rights in the land. Yeah. The Mahele is going to divide these undivided interests inland. This is an entire semester course in two hours. So it's a lot of material, yeah? But it's a lot of material because hopefully it's put on tape so if I die in a car accident, you guys have that material here, right? But it's a lot, there's a lot of details. So are there any questions before I move forward? I will 
prove it. Where you stand, where one, two, or three? Well, one is one is the government. Two is the chiefs. They worked that out in the 1848 Mahele, which is coming up, and then the Makai Nana. So your reference to the people of the land is not Kanaka, but Hawaii. When we're talking this, we're talking native tenants. Yeah? We're talking about those people who are getting <coughs> land in the traditional system. I give you service, you give me land. That's these guys. <coughs> That's what's going on here. This is the traditional system. This is Kalai Aina, 18, 40, 18, 17, 70, 17, 80, what we've been doing for the last 100 years. That's this. You have guys that have land in a different relationship that once the ship captains come, hey, come here, I'd like some land, come here, gives him some land. That's a different thing than this. The people who are acknowledged, this is called the Hawaiians. Kua Aina, native tenants, whatever term you want to use, all the Ali, all the Hawaiians. The Mahale, the Great Division, why was it needed? To sit in judgment on the past is not always advisable. It is easy in the light of subsequent events to perceive what would have been the wiser course. But it is not always easy to put ourselves in the places of our predecessors, to realize what difficulties may have beset them and what obstacles may have prevented the carrying out of their own conceptions of what should have been done. We can all play Monday morning quarterback. Well, you should have done this because I have history on my side. I watch Sports Center. I know what the results of the game were. You should have ran instead of thrown, right? We can all play Monday morning quarterback. But when you're in the moment, how do you make a decision based on the information at hand, right? You don't have hindsight. I cannot go on hindsight. I got information. Do I go left or do I go right? Both of those decisions have consequences. So this is a quote from C.J. Lyons, yeah? but it's not always easy to put ourselves in the places of our predecessors. Why would Kamehameha III want to change the land tenure system? Because of the influence of the outside countries coming in. Influence of the outside countries coming in? Yeah. What else? To protect the people. How? By giving them interest in the land. Right? You, buy the you give you acknowledge that that person owns it, they're protected. Right? You don't acknowledge their interest in land. Stop. Right? What other reasons? 1778, all the all, all the ship captains come, Kotzebue and De Freysane and all of these guys come and they say there's not a single acre of Hawaii that could have been cultivated okay. more. Every piece of acre that could be cultivated is cultivated. 1778, 1780, 1790, that's what all the ship captains are saying. Agriculture coming out of their ears, holy smokes, how do they, how do, they do this, right? 1840, 1850, not the case. Population in at time of continual contact, 1780, 400,000. Population in 1850, 40,000. 80,000, 80,000, 90,000 to 50. Now imagine you're living in Wainai Valley and there's once 100 people and then now 20. there's 20. You 20, now I've got to do the work of 100. Right? The system starts to fall apart because of depopulation. One of the common myths about the Mahele is that the Mahele was the thing that drove a wedge between the people and the land. That wedge was already there. The land was already unproductive by 1850. It was unproductive because there were 20 per, 80 percent less people. Right? Land couldn't be cultivated more. Weeds. Right? The cause of the weeds was depopulation. The cause of the weeds was we only got 20 percent of the population alive. The Hawaiians. There was already a wedge between the Hawaiians and the land. There weren't enough people to work the land. Right? The Mahele did not drive a wedge. The Mahele was the solution was one of the purported solutions to that problem of unproductive lands. 
because the lands were already unproductive. The Mahele did not make the land unproductive. Yeah. Was the disease. Yeah. So depopulation and securing people's rights. Yeah. The most common story is these guys story, right? When you're reading the Mahale, all the history books are going to tell you why these guys wanted private property. Their perspective, their lens, their idea. They wanted private property because it's going to make the lands productive. They wanted private property because you need the private incentive in order to motivate someone to work the land, right? If I can, if you can work on your land and I can just come and take everything, what's the incentive for you to make improvements? Right? So that's what these guys are saying. That's that story. The story we haven't heard, why does Kamehameha III want this? He's the king. That guy's not the king. Here's the king. Here's the guy in charge. Yeah. This is the story we haven't heard. The records of the discussion in Privy Council show plainly His Majesty's anxious desire to free his lands from the burden of being considered public domain and as such, subjected to the danger of confiscation in the event of his islands being seized by any foreign power. Kamehameha III was aware that 1839, Captain Laplace comes, hey, we need $20,000, issue with the French Catholics. He starts gunboat diplomacy, starts, France starts threatening Hawaiian sovereignty. 1843, Britain and... Uh, not Thomas, who, who was here before Thomas? Paulette. Paulette. George Paulette takes Hawaiian sovereignty, 1843. If 1839 or 1843 had been permanent, what would have happened to all 4 million acres of Hawaii? Transferred to the country. Transferred to the, to the, dom to the government that took over. Why? Because it's all government property. Any government property is confiscated by an imperial power coming in. So if all 4 million acres are government property, in 1843 when Britain took over, all 4 million acres would have went to Britain. In 1839 when France took over, all 4 million acres would have been confiscated by France because it was, pri it was public, not private property. So this is often what happens. Yeah. The missionaries seem to be put above the king. Right? These guys wanted this. At that point, you making him their servant. At that point, they're the kings. And that guy is a puppet or whatever. <clears throat> we gotta keep things in perspective. Yeah? He was the king, they were advisors. Yes, they said, I would like private property. He had other things going on as a king that he had to consider. Depopulation, what do I do? The lands aren't productive, what do I do? As an ali'i, it has been my job from time immemorial to make sure the relationship between man and land is productive. How do I make lands productive again? Yeah. A, there's this threat of imperialism. Tahiti, I, got, I just got a letter from Queen Pomare. Tahiti just got taken over by the French. A, the French were just here in 1839. A, if they take us over, they're going to get every single acre of land. What's going to happen then to my Maka'e Nana who don't have land in private property? Now you've got to go ask a French guy, can I get my loi? Right? This is where you have to keep things in perspective. And not put these guys under those guys. If this were the reality, if this is what I saw in the documents, then I wouldn't be telling you, hey, come here and do this. But this is what I see in the documents. This is the story the documents tell me. If that were the truth, then that's the truth. I'm not trying to tell you, hey, this is the truth, but hey, we need, we need a psychological boost, so let's believe this, even though it's not true. Everything I've read tells me this is what's going on. <clears throat> James Kent, Commentaries on American Law. Um, in Privy Council, they discuss, they got four, five, six different books on international law. They get all of those books here. In Kent's commentaries, you'll read. The general usage now is not to touch private property upon land without making compensation. 
Kamehameha the Third in Privy Council. This is two weeks before the Mahele. If a foreign power should take the islands, what lands would they respect? Mr. Lee gave it as his opinion. Except in the case of resistance to and conquest by any foreign power, the king's right to his private lands would be respected. So would the rights to all private lands. Right? Private property. The general uses now is not to touch private property upon land without making compensation. Right? So if all 4 million acres of Hawaiian land was put into private property, then when a, someone came in, uh, the French, the British, anyone else came in, private property, the land would be protected. This was the reason Kauai Keoli Kamehameha III, another reason, right? Because the lands are already unproductive. We got weeds. How do we not get weeds? How do we make the lands more productive? Here we have the results of the Great Mahal. Yeah. Who got land? The very first thing that happens in the Mahele is they look at everyone who has land outside of the traditional system. Traditional system, I get land in exchange for service. On Fridays, I'm going to the chief's tarot patch and working in the chief's tarot patch. Right? These guys here, the ship captains, hey, come me, I'd like some land. It's 1780, hey, come me, I'd like some land. 1790, hey, Kipuanao, I'd like some land. Hey, governor of Kauai, I'd like some land. Whenever those guys, whenever these foreigners are getting land, they're getting land outside of that Kalai Aina, outside of that land in exchange for service system. These guys are all getting lands in what are essentially leases. So the first thing that the land commission is set up to do is to identify all of these claims outside of the traditional system. Yeah. And these are called borrowed gifts. <clears throat> the land commission is the most misunderstood thing in the Mahale. Yeah. What you need to understand about the land commission is what they were doing in 1846 is different than what they were doing in 1850. Today we understand the, the land commission. We think what they were doing in 1850, the Kuleana Act, is what they were doing in 1846, right? We all start a job. We got this much job responsibilities. Two years later, we got this much job responsibilities. Then we got this much job responsibilities, right? But what they were doing here was a different thing than what they were doing in 1850, right? So we gotta understand the Land Commission sequentially this way, not backwards in time, this way. Eighteen forty eight, we have the Mahele event, January twenty seventh through March seventh. The Mahele divides the un previously undivided interests of the Konohiki class. Subject to the rights of government, subject to the rights of native tenants, subject to the rights of government, subject to the rights of native tenants. We've only divided out the chiefs. Questions? We're in like week eight, that's why I have class, so and we're only thirty minutes in, so No questions, either I'm getting good at this or you guys are really smart. <laughs> so we're paying attention. Three classes. Mahele divides out the rights of the second class. Still got the rights of one and three, still got one and three. Okay. So how do you make a claim for what is rightfully your undivided interest in the land in both? We'll get there. We're getting that. That's 10 slides from now, and then your bigger question is, is the last slide. <laughs> the day after the Mahele, Kawi Keoli takes his two and a half million acres, divides be between himself, representative of government, and himself, the private individual. This is how we get the king's land, this is how we get government lands. Keeps one million acres for himself, gives the government one and a half million acres, this is the king's land, which later gets known as the crown lands after 1865. This is the government lands. Rent and proceeds from this go to the government treasury for the benefit of all the citizenry. Rents and proceeds and profits from this go to Kawikeoli, the person, his pocket, his private bank account. And these descendants? 
we'll get that's the crown lens that's a different PowerPoint you can tell Lynette get me get me for next semester we can do the crown lens. Crown lens is its whole own thing yeah but the important thing in that regards private property of the king yeah? this is George Bush's ranch in Texas not the White House this is the White House. But even that metaphor is not clear because Hawaii is slightly different than, than that metaphor. These lands over here are our Konehiki lands. These are basically our Ali'i Trust. This is Kamehameha Schools. This is QLCC. This is uh, Luna Lilo. This is, you name your Ali'i Trust, that's the Konehiki land. Commutation is the mechanism which divides out the rights of government. There are but three classes of persons having vested rights in the land. First the government, second the chiefs, third the native tenants. Mahele of 1848 divides out the rights of the chiefs. Commutation is the mechanism, one of the mechanisms which divides out the rights of government. This is different depending on the genealogy of your title. If you're getting land from here, it's a different thing than if you're getting oral gifts, than if you're getting kuleana lands. But broad conceptually speaking, commutation divides out the rights of government. Commutation means to exchange. What's being exchanged is the government's interest. The government's interest is the fee simple title. I give you money, government gives me fee simple title. Least to fee conversion. I'm renting, I want to buy the fee, I give money, owner gives me the fee, same idea here, commutation. Okay. Konehikis could give back one by law, could give back one third of the lands or money. In the 1860s, I forget the year, 1850s, 1860s, a whole bunch of them come together and give back approximately one-third of their lands. They previously had one and a half million acres, giving back a third, gave back 500,000 acres. They gave land, government gave fee simple title. At this point, these chiefs have fee simple title to their lands, government's interests extinguished, subject to the rights of native tenants. Questions? <coughs> <laughs> so this is what we have going on. The oral gifts are outside of traditional system. This is the traditional system. These are all guys, land for service, land for service, since the last 200, 300, 400 years, since the time of Mailipu Kahi. Oral gifts, these are all the ship captains, all the foreigners who are coming and say, hey chief, I'd like some land. They got some land, what did they get? King's land, government lands, Konehiki lands. 1850, we get the Kuleana Act. The Kuleana Act is one of the mechanisms which divided out the rights, the interests of the native tenant class. Mahele of 1848 divides out the rights of the chiefs. Commutation divides out the rights of government. Kuleana Act divides out the rights of native tenants. We've now Divided, Mahalid, everybody's undivided interests. We can go home drink beer now. Paul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions? Oral gifts. The captains that was given land from the true monarch, do they still hold title to that land? Or, like you said, it was on lease? Some were leases, some were mm -hmm. like estates, some were fee simple. Yeah, I you gotta some, read the document. I know some, some give them the, the whole acreage to the, that family. The reason I bring them up is because I get two in my family Alexander Adam and John Harbottle. I think I have a Harbottle example in here. Uh, Ohiki Lolo, yeah. to my knowledge, is Harbottle. Uh, oh, Ohiki Lolo Ranch was an oral mm -hmm. gift mm -hmm. to a, to a Harbottle. Um, Harbada also got lands in Kaneohe, 600-something acre Ilukuponos in Kaneohe. Um, 
I know Alexander Aaron was over 2,000 something acres. It was near that <coughs> in Kulio of Makai and Nara Fish Pond. Yep. That's where the thing is I and I know it comes in. Yep. Yeah. 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 Like, so for the Oregon, like the estates would be like the Damien estates. Um, I don't know specifically Damien Estates where it comes from. Um, I'm assuming it's Damien Estates is coming either from Konohiki land or might also be Crown lands, could be government lands, but most likely one of these two. Right? Because Damien, after the overthrow, Damien guys go into all the LAE trusts and they become the trustees. And then they start selling land to themselves, basically. So I don't know where the Damien Estates comes from. But um, if you guys seen the video, Taking Waikiki, Taking Waikiki, if you YouTube Taking Waikiki, it's a video about how Waikiki became Waikiki. And uh, basically, Dillingham and W.O. Smith started a private company, Guardian Trust. W.O. Smith was the head trustee for Kamehameha Schools, ends up selling 80 acres to himself and Dillingham, Guardian Trust. Right? So after they, after they go, they infiltrate all the landed trusts, and that's how all, a lot of the landed trusts get depleted. Right? But Hawaiians didn't get land, Mahana was the worst thing. This is why we've got to understand. Because if you understand the genealogy, you understand where the Huli happened. The Huli happened from the overthrow, not from private property. That's, that's my argument. That the reality we see today is from the overthrow. That's when they flipped the script. Private property, when we were driving the bus, Things were okay. And I'm going to say they were perfect. Things were okay. Things were fine. After they overthrew the country, that's when they started selling lands to themselves. Sugar got lands post-overthrow, not, not pre-overthrow. The ranches are who is buying lands pre-overthrow. Sugar is not the dominant economy in Hawaii until post-1870. Right? Our Paniolo country, our, our Paniolo culture. But the, all the ranching is the ranching is the dominant economy up until the 1870s, because 1872, Pennsylvania, William Penn, Pennsylvania gets discovers crude oil. Crude oil discovery means we don't need whale oil. Why? Hawaii is the center for whaling. Stop in Hawaii, go up to the Aleutians, come back. Bananas don't last long. Salted beef does. Salted beef is the dominant thing for the whaling economy. 1870s, you have whaling going down, 1880s you have sugar going up. But sugar doesn't become the dominant industry till post overthrow. I'm not saying there weren't sugar plantations, I'm not saying they didn't make a million dollars, I'm just saying it wasn't the dominant economy, what we know sugar as till post 1900. Sugar doesn't buy their lands till post 1900. Sugar is leasing lands from the crown before, sugar doesn't buy a I can't say that because someone's going to find one acre and prove me wrong. Sugar is leasing 900,000 acres of crown lands. That's where sugar is getting their lands. This is ranches. This is ranches. This is sugar. Yeah? But that's the different part. That's the different part. Right. Okay. <laughs> Since you said earlier that all of this happened because of the Ovocho, and that we know now that the Ovocho is illegal, so. Can we claim oh that on 25 slides for now? Let me get it. Let me get it. Let me get it. Let me get it. Yep. So, all of the activity, did it distinguish the Makainanan's um, claim? Last slide. That's literally the last slide. Mm -hmm. I'll get that. Yeah. Yeah. The common yeah. idea today is if you were a if you didn't file your claim, if a native tenant didn't file their claim between February 14th, 1846 and February 14th, 1848, rights law. I'll show you evidence that says not true, which then says, what do we do today? Yeah. But the Mahale is not ours, the Mahale was a foreign imposition, the Mahale... The missionaries are the ones who did the Mahele, so we're not looking for those kinds of things. Right? This is why you, we have to take ownership of ownership. This was our ancestors doing this, and if you come from that perspective, you will see what they left you. Because the other perspective tells you they left, you didn't get nothing because somebody else did it. So you're not going to go looking for something that's yours. 
But I'm telling you, we got all kind of stuff preserved. Yeah. We just we just think somebody else did it, so we don't look. So the definition of fee property today is different from what is embedded in there. Totally unique. That that's where I say it's Western properties assimilation into Hawaiian property. So it's not Hawaiian property assimilating into Western because then that's not true. Hawaii totally different. We got fisheries. We got subject. We got right to thatch. Aho cord. This that. We got all of these different things that don't exist in the company. Totally unique system of private property in Hawaii. Think about this. Hawaii transitioned to private property in 1848 without maps. The Mahele Book of 1848 is a 200-page book with a listing of place names. Where's the maps? 252 chiefs could sit in that room and I could tell you Kailua is yours, Waimanalo is yours, Hei is yours, and we all knew the boundaries. They didn't need a map. Yeah. You're telling me those 20 missionaries knew all the boundaries for all 1,500 to 2,000 Ahupua? Oh, yes. Why are we even using Ahupua? In the continent, we have the public land survey system. We have a checkerboard grid. You fly over the Midwest, you're going to see all the roads, checkerboard grid. Public land survey system. Where's our checkerboard <laughs> grid? You buy a land, you buy a house today, your land title goes back to an Ahupua. If you're a missionary, are you making land title go back to an Ahupua? That's not what they did in India, that's not what they did in New Zealand, that's not what they did in you name your colony. Well, we're not a colony, we were a country in 1843. Mm -hmm. This is where I love Keanu's metaphor of the uh, Hawaiian Airlines. 1843, we got our own airplane. Hawaiian Airlines. We're flying with American Airlines, we're flying with British Airways, we're flying with all the different countries in the world, 1843. 1893 comes along, they cover up the Hawaiian logo, they put the American Airlines logo, they get the, the Hawaiian Airlines out, they go Kalani, and they put the President Sanford Dole in. Right? Now more information, more information, more information, the chip's starting to paint away, we're starting to say, hey, What's that Hawaiian logo doing under the American Air Airlines logo? We thought it was American Airlines, but this is really Hawaiian Airlines. Yeah. This is ours. I'm getting the truth. Right. But that's, that's that taking ownership of ownership. This is ours. Yeah. Right? But you got to pay attention to the details and not give that away. Something as simple as saying, hey, the Mahele was a foreign imposition, you're giving all of this away. You don't even realize what you're giving away. If that's the truth, that's the truth. Everything I've read tells me not the truth. If I'm a missionary, I do not transition to private property. How Hawaii transition to private property? If you're trying to impose yourself and your property law in Hawaii, you failed big time. Where's the maps? Where's the public land survey system? Where, why didn't you get rid of place names? Right? All of that stuff starts to get done post overthrow. <clears throat> So here we have what happens to the land between, between 1846 and 1893. The crown lands get sold as Kamehameha deeds between 1848 and 1865. In 1865, Lot Kapuaiba comes into power, comes in and asks the ledge to make the lands inalienable. Inalienable cannot sell. Cannot sell means from 1865 to 1893, the crown lands were available for lease. Crown Land Commission leases. This is where sugar is leasing not, literally the whole 900,000 acres of Crown Lands through the Crown Land Commission. Yeah. Government lands, over 667,000 acres of government lands sold between this time to go check how much of the Konohiki lands. A lot of the Konohiki lands got sold, various reasons. Some of the Konohikis didn't have heirs. 400,000, 80,000. One fifth of the population is alive. Family of five means one person is alive out of a family of five. Who's my heir? Who's my heir to inherit? I'm the only survivor. Yeah? So a lot of people died without heirs. A lot of <clears throat> Maui, you get a lot of the, the ranches purchasing from Konohiki on Maui. Um. 
This is where you get terms like royal patent grant, land patent grant, commitment deeds, crown land leases, and this is the important one to understand. There's three different kinds of land commission awards. Oral gifts, konhiki awards, kuleana awards. Oral gifts, what they were doing in 1846. Konhiki awards, this is from the Mahele of 1848. Kuleana awards, this is from the Kuleana Act of 1850. Yeah. How we understand them today is uh, it's all land commission awards. It's one big pot of stew. It's a land commission award. There's different kinds. They were doing different things in different years. In 1846, they were doing this. 1848, they were doing this and this. 1850, they were doing that. Questions? Week 12, week 13. No scared ass. <laughs> if you don't ask now, you can be lost even more later. So it, you should ask now if you have a question. Because it scaffolds, yeah? Oh, you like it? Do you have all this information in the packet for us to take home and study? I don't, but um, what I have my master's thesis, which has a whole chapter on this. I'm, I haven't released this yet, and I haven't done any of this yet, but I started a website, greatmahele.org, mm -hmm. kind of similar to hawaiinkingdom.org slash blog. Um, and on greatmahele.org, I will have... Um, videos of me doing this same presentation so that you can watch it over and over mm. 10 times, 100 times if you'd like. <laughs> yeah. And <clears throat> what you guys should know is I watched a similar presentation on the Mahele 20, 30, 40 times, literally. And I learned something new each time. This is not something that I expect you to get. Hey, you watch it one time. Oh, I got it. Two times. Oh, I got it. This is, I don't know how many years of my life in 80 slides, right? So you need the exposure and the greatmahalem.org is what I'm going to use for that. Uh, the military but nothing's up on there now. Now it's just going to say this is the future site of a discussion on private property. Military claims that they own the Kuliana land in fee. Military, uh, in Makor specifically, all the Kuliana properties there, they say they own, that is properties that they have in fee. And one of the areas that I was occupying at one point uh, was a Kamaka Kuliana, and we got permission from the head of the Kamaka family to be there. But the government came in and said, no, you cannot. This is all government land. This is state property, or this is fee simple from the military, so you're not able to <coughs> occupy those lands. And so what I'm hearing is that there's a makainana or some rights there. So I, I'm trying to understand how do we do that kind of discussion in court, because you see it on a basis of Western fee ownership. This perspective, unfortunately, for those of us who are fighting land issues today, is a perspective that I would say would hold true under a Hawaiian Kingdom judicial system. State of Hawaii, you're going to be paddling a very, the rules as they go along. very hard and long paddle. With that being said, what, what people would need to do, people would need to organize and get little bits piece by piece court case by court if you, if you go here and lay out this whole thing in one court case they're gonna find some way to shut things down how they do and not follow the law right but if you can get one little thing in precedent 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 if someone is looking strategically long term, to win the war, not the battle, then, but nobody wants to lose the battle because that's their house, right? So that's where the difficulty of this comes in. And in our case, it was about access, not about a house, it was about access. Yeah, but land in general, or, yeah. you know, my rights to, to my land. So a lot of this in that sense, I don't want to say it's obsolete, but it's somewhat obsolete because the state of Hawaii does not have this perspective. The state of Hawaii says, 
we're just like America. So they're always going to be hell. And they're always going to be literally in second place. But they, they, they have to be because their foundation is on illegality. Right. right. 1893, illegal overthrow. Land Act, illegal. Confiscation of the Crown Lands, illegal. Like, they can't even claim eminent domain on the Crown Lands. They basically just said, what you, what people, what is private is public. They literally just wrote in the 1894 mm -hmm. Constitution, Article 95, or um, I forget the specific article, those lands that used to be considered public property now belong to us. I mean, it's literally just, I declare those lands that used to belong to the Crown to now belong to us. And who's us? The Republic of Hawaii. The, that's how they confiscated the Crown lands. Because they needed these lands, because who's leasing these lands? Them. The sugar. Them. Right? Why do they want these lands? Because they're inalienable. You cannot buy these lands according to Hawaiian Kingdom law. So you overthrow the government, you make these lands what used to be inalienable, alienable after the overthrow. Now they start selling these lands to themselves in the 1900s when their leases are up. That's literally what happens to the Crown Lands. Hanale, story of Hanale, George Clooney, descendants, Crown Lands. That's how they get the Crown Lands, but that's that other PowerPoint. He was getting me <laughs> off track. <laughs> I've been on this slide for like 20 minutes. <laughs> Land Commission Awards. Establishment of the Land Commission. To be a board for the investigation and final ascertainment or rejection of all claims of private individuals, whether natives or foreigners, to any landed property acquired anterior to the passage of this act. Prior to. Okay. So this is the interesting one, right? What kinds of natives would have claims to land that are outside of Kalaiaina? Rereading Kaikindal the other day. Kaikindal has a reference to a class of natives that are not native tenants. Yeah. So there's a bunch of natives, and whether that is native Hawaiians, ethnic Hawaiians, or natives born on the soil but not ethnic, I haven't figured out yet, but there was a class of natives who basically weren't participating in that system. They were working for the foreigners. So because they were working for the foreigners, they were in the cash economy. So they weren't doing labor tax for the Konehitis. And this class of natives um, are, that's the class of natives that would have had claims to land that are outside of the traditional system. Because they weren't showing up for Po'olimos on Fridays working in the Loi. They were working cash economy for the foreigners. <laughs> so they had kind of land way. in a different system, and that's the kind of native that would have been doing this. Yeah. So, so this is the oral gifts. The oral. This is the oral gifts. And that's the kind of natives that would have had an oral gift and not a Kuleana land award. The commission was authorized to consider possession of land acquired by oral gift of Kamehameha the first or one of his high chiefs, Harris versus Carter. Yeah, that's where I get the term oral gift. You gotta watch us academics. We like to make up our own words so that yeah, but that's where it's from. Harris versus Carter. Yeah, oral gift. So examples of oral gifts. Land Commission Award number one, very first one to John Voss. There can be no doubt, therefore, that the title is in the government unencumbered except by the residence of Voss's lease. What kind of title? Lease. Lease. Voss's lease. Title is in the government. John Voss doesn't own this. He has a lease. Right. Our bottle. Mm -hmm. Present claim is for different lands which are situated in the island of Oahu, Hawaiian Islands, all of which were received by the claimant from his father in the year 1832 the time of his decease, who received them from Kamehameha I a long time before and held them without dispute to the time when he left them to the claimant at his death, as stated in evidence of this board. We therefore award to the claimant William Harbottle a freehold title to these lands less than a lodio 
which he may commute for a fee simple title in accordance with the law. Right? So here we have freehold less than a loyal. This is the most misunderstood term in related to the Mahele. This is the difference between renting and owning. I literally had someone in the title industry who's high up in the title industry who trains all the other title people tell me, I did not know that freehold less than a lodeo meant that. That's an admission that I didn't know that this deed said I rented and not owned. That's, and I don't say that to disparage that person. I say that to give you guys an understanding that the mahele is misunderstood even by the state of Hawaii today, even by the title industry today, down to the basic definition. This term, freehold less than allodial, is not in the Hoa Lucas's Dictionary of Hawaiian Legal Land Terms. How is this term not in the dictionary? If it's not in the dictionary, you're not going to find it, you're not going to find it, you're not going to know that this is, you don't own it, you're renting. renting. Question in the back? Who signed the document? This one is the, the Land Commission, the Board of Commissioners. Some of the, some people found that some of the documents were forged. Yep. Not, not all of them were, were entirely true. Yeah. So yep. There are some that are in question. I haven't seen any of those, so I cannot speak to that. But that's a whole different kind of, whole different kind of thing. Yeah. So freehold less than a lawyer. We'll come back to this to find a definition. But if we just look at it here, which he may commute, which he may exchange, commutation, Black's Law dic Dictionary, exchange, which he may commute for a fee simple title. Does he have the fee simple title? No. No. Yeah. Because, well, even just keep the free old less than a lawyer out of it. Which he may exchange for a fee simple title. Does he have the fee? No. Not if he can exchange for it. If he can exchange for it, that means he doesn't have it. Right? So we know, just from the context of the sentence, that a freehold less than a lodeo is less than a fee simple title. Because right? you can exchange for the fee. That means you don't got it. If you can exchange for it, you don't got it yet. So just from the context of the document, fee simple, freehold less than a lodeo, less than. We'll see if that holds true. Land Commission Award number 433 to William Croningberg. And we do therefore award to the claimant, William Croningberg, a freehold title less than a lodeo, or in other words, a life estate in said land, which he may, which he may commute for a fee simple title as prescribed by law. Uh, here we get the definition. This definition is only in about 10 of the 10,000 land commission awards. So you're not going to find it unless you read all 10,000 awards, and then you gotta find, and then you got to find the 10 that have it. So one out of a thousand, needle in a haystack, which is why it's not in Nohoa Lucas's dictionary, right? I'm not saying anything to disparage Nohoa or Puake or whoever put together that book. It's literally in one in a thousand documents, right? And, let, and unless you've read them all, not going to find it. With that said, <laughs> well, we, we, we did find the 10 because Wahine and I worked on a project where we transcribed all the land commission awards, so that's how I know there's 10 because we transcribed them all, and when I did a search, there were 10 of them, right? So that's how we found out there were 10. Okay. With that said, land this land commission award is found in Chinen, the Great Mahele, page 10. Of the 10,000 land commission awards that John Chinen chose to reproduce. He reproduced one land commission award in his book. That book, that land commission he chose, this one, that has the definition of freehold less than a lodeo. Right? So we can say, well, it's in one in 10,000 documents, but if you read Chinen, it's in Chinen. Chinen's the authority. Everybody's read Chinen. How, do we, how did we miss this as a society? That book was published 50 years ago. How did every single scholar, every single lawyer, every single title person not read page 10 of Chinen? Right? 
So what I what I want us to get from this is, yes, it's hidden, but it's hidden right in front of our faces. Right? It's not so hidden that you can't find it. This is literally hidden Chinen page 10. So we have an excuse for not knowing, but we also don't have an excuse for not knowing. If you are in the business of scholarship, you should have found this. Read Chinen. It's in Chinen. But we skip all the pictures, right? You know, a picture, okay, skip, go on next, maybe some text. Don't, don't, don't believe me. Go pick up Great Manila, page 10, and go see. It's William Crowley Bird. Free old lesson alone. Yeah? So life estate. A, a life estate is a lease for the duration of a person's life. As long as Tutu is alive, Tutu uh, can stay in the house. When Tutu passes, it goes to whoever owns the house. Yeah? That's a life estate. Instead of I have a lease for 10 years, I have a lease for five years, have a lease for as long as a person, some person is alive. That's a life estate. Which is less than, be simple, right? Which you may commute for a fee. For a fee. Means you don't got the fee. Life estate's not a fee. Life estate is a lease for the, or you have access, use, possession for the duration of your life. Royal Patent upon Land Commission Award number 1111. Whereas the Board of Commissioners to Quiet Land Titles have by their decision awarded unto William Croningberg, claim number 433, an estate of freehold less than a lodial. That term is in the typescript of this document. There's tens of thousands of this document. This is a government template. And that word, freehold less than a lodial, is not defined in the Dictionary of Hawaiian Legal Land Terms, even though it's in the typescript, this isn't a handwritten, and a state of freehold less than a lodial. It's in the typescript of every single government document, not defined. How? Right? This is, again, to show you guys, the Mahele is misunderstood. Down to the basic level, step one, definition. What do all the terms in this document mean? Don't know. Right? That's how misunderstood the Mahele is. With that said, I wasn't the one who, who found this. This was shown to me by Dr. Keanu Sai. Yeah, so I don't want to sit here and be like, oh, I was the one who found him. I'm the smart guy. wasn't me. Yeah? This was shown to me. This was taught to me. Whereas the Board of Commissioners to Quiet Land Titles have by their decision awarded to William Croningberg, therefore Kamehameha, by the grace of God, King of the Hawaiian Islands, by this royal patent, makes known unto all men that he is given to his successors in office in this day, granted and given absolutely in fee simple unto William Croningberg. So, <clears throat> there's another, I don't want to get into it too much, but there's, there's another thing going out there in our Hawaiian community where people are saying royal patents are some trump card and if your tutu got a royal patent then you can go back and claim that land today. Yeah? I am not of that understanding. Yeah? If you look here, by this royal patent I got a fee simple title. If tutu legitimately sold 50 years ago, tutu sold. We don't have a claim back to a piece of land that Tutu legitimately sold. I'm not talking about when the plantations came in and wiped out boundaries and did shenanigans. That's a whole different story. If Tutu legitimately sold 50 years ago, Tutu sold, gone. Yeah, there is no trump card. Royal patents aren't some kind of trump card. Royal patent means you got the fee. <coughs> royal patent on a land commission award means you got the fee. A royal patent grant means you got a fee simple sale of government land. Royal patents in both cases just mean you got the fee simple title. Doesn't mean you can go claim the land today because Tutu sold legitimately. Legitimate, not if illegitimate, that's a different story. Yeah? But I don't want Hawaiians today to get caught down going down then we're only making more problems. Then we only we're going fishing and everybody's kicking up the water and I cannot see nothing now. Right? We gotta start trying to cuckoo in the water and clearing the water so we can see what's going on not making things more muddy, so I can't see nothing, right? <clears throat> but that's a whole nother story. 
Land Commission Award number 807, to have and to hold the same during the term of 299 years from the fifth day of our Lord in the year 1,826, free of all rents, fees, and charges. How many of you want a 299 year lease free of all rents and charges? No. But, there's always a but, mm. this award is upon the following express condition. Namely, that at the expiration of the aforesaid term, the land with all houses, tenements, buildings, and improvements thereon shall revert to the Sandwich Island government. You gotta read the documents. Every story is different. Every piece of land is different. The worst thing you can do with the Mahele is generalize. You gotta know the story of each piece of land, because it's different. Yeah. If you're the Hawaiian Kingdom government, I hope you're looking for this land 299 years from now. Because it belongs to the government, not to whoever's on it. For example, if this is Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center, if this is Ala Moana Hotel, I don't know what's on it. I've never looked. I should go look, but I haven't. Yeah. Wahine, go look for me. 807. <laughs> Tell me what's on it. Question. Hawaiian Kingdom government. Makes reference to Kamehameha the first back in the time of Vancouver, ceded Hawaii <coughs> Island to Vancouver to King George. Kamehameha placed himself under King George, made him a Kanaka Brittany, yeah. uh, subject of, of Britain, of uh, yeah Britain. And back to that relationship of that's why the chiefs kept it because of Sandwich Island and Kamehameha putting himself under King George. Then Kamehameha II goes to England to find out what's our relationship. Oh, you're not claiming us. Then they start to lose. Okay, if, you, if we're not part of you, Britain, then we're going to be our own thing. Then Kamehameha III, what? We're not part of Britain? Okay, we got to go get independence. That's kind of that genealogy of independence there. So the Sandwich thing, the Sandwich Island government, is not created to this day? Or is that gone? It would be the state of Hawaii today if there is a treaty of annexation merging sovereignty, but there is none, so, but that's a, whoever the lawful government is 299 years from now should know that this land is theirs and not this lessee's. Yeah. Keanu was two weeks ago, right? A couple weeks ago? That's where all of that stuff comes in. Here we have a lease, right? So here you have all of these different oral gifts, all of these different leases going on. We're still in oral gifts. This is all oral gifts. No. Claim number 690 to Lewis Gravier. In other words, the said Keikuanawa and his wife Kalole conveyed to Elizabeth Elizabeth Graver is the daughter of Louis Graver. A fee simple title in said lot, which was more than Keiko and Nawa had any right or power to convey, as they thereby conveyed away the rights of the king or government in the lot. This is the only, this is the most explicit definition I have seen of the government's interest or the government's land. What's the government's interest? I told you guys the fee, right? I got that from here as they, a fee simple title, as they thereby conveyed away the rights of the king or government. Well, what's the rights of the king or government then? The fee, right? This is literally the only document I have ever seen to define government's rights, government's interests. And the land commission have no power to grant such a title in conformity with the deed aforesaid unless the government first relinquished their rights to said lot. So Keiko Anawa sells this, title says, the deed says in fee simple, Keiko Anawa is not the highest ranking chief, he's not the highest ranking chief, can't sell the fee, therefore what do you do? They kick it to Privy Council, <coughs> Privy Council discusses, Kamehameha III tells Keiko Anawa, well in the past you've given land to us without compensation, so in this occasion, in this occasion only, we will acknowledge the fee, we will waive the government's interest. So, Elizabeth Graver did not pay any commutation in this. The government on their own relinquished and waived the government's interests. Yeah. So in this, Elizabeth Graver, Louis Graver, get a fee simple title. So now we've seen an example of an oral gift lease, oral gift life estate, oral gift fee simple title.
The bigger point I hope you guys get is each document is different. You have to read the document to figure out does he own it or not, or is he leasing it. Now you cannot generalize, oh, the, the foreigner is getting all the land. No, they got a lease. Lease goes back to the owner later. Louis Gravier, another Louis, a different Louis Gravier award. Louis Gravier, 692. We do therefore award to Louis Gravier a freehold title less than a lodeo, or in other words, a life estate in the land of Paukawila in the district of Wailua. Paukawila is a 615-acre ilikupono out in uh, country, Haleiwa, uh, Kauai Law, Pa'ala aside. <clears throat> The claimant may commute the freehold awarded to him into a fee simple title as prescribed by law. Right? Obviously does not have the fee. He has, in other words, a life estate. In this instance, Louis Graver 692 does not get the royal patent. No royal patent, no fee simple, no fee simple. When Louis Graver dies, land is supposed to revert back to the government, the fee owner. Did that happen? Which way? The names. One more, one more for the index. The names. Yep. The Empu one. I have that document on here because the Empu is my name. So Ehu would have got royal patents, so Ehu <coughs> got a fee simple title in Pa'ala'a for five acres. No can though, because Hawaiians never get land. <laughs> I'm being playful. The dominant idea in in at UH is the mahe, mahele was the worst thing. Hawaiians didn't get land, right? So how Hawaiians didn't get land? How your family could have got land? Hawaiians never get land. The mahele was introduced. It was foreign. It was. That's where you have to understand the. <clears throat> Hawaiians got land. Yeah? That's why every one of us probably has a story of loss of land, right? This idea that Hawaiians didn't get land cannot be true if everyone in this room has a story of loss of land. If you lost land, you got land. So something has to change. The dominant story that says we didn't get land is probably wrong, right? If we all lost land. That's why the more that you live and Did it, did it revert? Resolved that the life estate of Louis Gravier and Paul Kawila having expired by his decease, the same be placed in the hands of Mr. Emerson to be disposed of to natives under the instructions and subject to the approval of the Minister of Interior. Right. So here you got 16, 615 acre goes out via lease, via life estate, that guy dies, comes back to the government, government says, A, give it to the Minister of Interior to sell it to natives. The story is complicated. Right? You cannot just go off the general statistics because what you're going to do? This is in 1851, he dies. Right? Does this 615 acres get sold to natives? We'll look later. All of those were examples of oral gifts. Yeah. Um, I used to make the joke that we need somebody in this room to go spend two years of their life to figure out what that acreage is. Literally, that's a master's thesis, and uh, we now have someone who's going to spend two years of his life uh, so that I can have one statistic on one slide. <laughs> right? But that's what it takes. It takes these kinds of two years here, two years there, we've got to build. got to build. The work on the Mahal is not done. Right? I haven't solved it. I haven't figured it out. We, there's lots more work to do. Now we're going to take a look at Konohiki Awards, <laughs> the 252 chiefs who got land via the Mahele. This is the Mahele book, Buke Kakao Pa'a. Um, when I first started doing land research, I probably had a seventh generation Xerox. A Xerox of 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 a Xerox. I couldn't tell if that was noise from the Xerox machine, or is that an I, or is that an E, or is that an A, or is that a... Plus it's all in script, it's hard enough to read as it is. Right now, you can Google Department of Accounting and General Services Mahele book, and you got a clean copy legible in your in your hands. You can all go and read what the sixteen hundred thousand ahuwa are. Uh, <clears throat> left side of the book, Kamehameha the third. Right side of the book, one of the two hundred and fifty-two chiefs. 
Now, aina ahupua'a, kalana, mokupuni, the name, yeah, whether it's an ahupua or an ili, the district it's in, the island it's on. Waialua is an ahupua'a in Puna, Hawaii. Uh, Hulaia is aina bipi, beef lands in Puna, Hawaii, or yeah, Kauai, ha, Kauai. Uh, Kalalao, Napali, Kauai. These lands belong to you, Kamehameha. These lands belong to you, Kamamalu. I don't have rights in your lands. You don't have rights in my lands. I hereby agree to this division. It is satisfactory. The lands above inscribed are the kings. I have no right to them. I hereby agree to this division. The lands above are Kamamalus. She has permission to take them before the land commission. This is now 1848. Now the land commission has a second job. right? These chiefs weren't didn't have to put in a claim before February 14th, 1848. This is a different thing. This is now job number two, the Mahele. Right? You may now take it before the land commission. This is not, they didn't have to put in a claim to begin with. This is a different thing going on. <coughs> Here we have land commission award 7713, Victoria Kamal Kamamalu upon a 30. This is for Mauna Lua, Iloko Waimanalo, Mako Laupoko. Totally different template, right? The other ones, I got this land from my father who got it from Kamehameha, genealogy of the land. Here you just have Wim Little Lee, boom, 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 mm. because we figured all of this out in the Mahale. Right? I, if you go look at Victoria Kamamalu, you're going to see Mauna Lua in Ilikupono, in Waimanalo, under Kamamalu's name. Yeah, and then Apana 31 is going to be for a different place that's in the Mahale book so on and so forth. So that's an example of a Konohiki Award. Kuleana Award. <clears throat> to your question. Means and remedies may be altered, but the rights themselves, if vested, cannot be constitutionally disturbed. This is one admitted doctrine of civilized jurisprudence. Another of its admitted doctrines, even in the exposition of new law, is that the old law must first be understood and the mischief intended to be cured by it in order to apply the remedy. You want to fix the problem? You got to know what the old law was. We got problems today, let's figure out what our Hawaiian Kingdom laws were. This was John Record, 1846. But the rights themselves, if vested, cannot be constitutionally disturbed. If they can't be constitutionally disturbed, they sure as hell can't be statutorily disturbed. There are but three classes of persons having vested rights in the land. First the chiefs, first the government, second the chiefs, third the native tenants. Rights vested cannot be constitutionally disturbed. Do they still exist today? John Recorder yes. tells me they do. But the Mahale was a foreign imposition, it wasn't ours. <laughs> we got to understand what was ours. Would that document be used in a court of law? Sure, it could. I'm sure they'd find a way to not admit it. But I'm not. Go do it. Go try. Yeah, like this. Uh, sorry, but going back to the the, the Konohiki, um, like we was trying to stop the development of Ho'opili. so we went down to the land, um, the Bureau of Conveyance, and we found out there was only one name, and that was uh, Miriam Kikaonohi. Yeah, so she she was the only name that was recorded for that four thousand something acres of all Honolulu. Mm -hmm. And then, like twenty years later, then it gets signed by Kalakau or something like that. But it was it was kind of fishy, you know. But that was the only name that we found. So is can we still use that <laughs> to freaking stop that desecration? I I would I would have to look. Like each story is. Like even the Makua thing, yeah, like I, I don't know if, if the state of Hawaii in the 19, what year did they, did they claim eminent domain? How did they clear the Kuleanas in Makua? On their maps. On their maps. Did they claim eminent domain and give the people cash consideration for it? They did? <laughs> well, at, a, at gunpoint. Oh. <laughs> so um, some of them, here's a box. Yeah, so whether that qualifies for eminent domain? Okay. They had a gun. <clears throat> and, you know, that's, 
that's the crazy thing, right? Like, if, if you try to do that in America today, go to Michigan and try to do that. The militias are out. You do not mess with American private property. Right? <coughs> that is the fundamental notion of America. My land, my property, don't tell me what to do. This is my private property. And they violate, in Hawaii, they violate sovereignty. The most, what is a state? They violate that in international law and they violate, they confiscate and take private property without compensation. The two most sacred things you can do in law, they violate. Right? And that's the crazy, craziness today. Right? Like, how do you get around that? 1850 Kulean Act. That three simple titles, free of commutation. So is a Kulea, what kind of title does a Kuleana award give me? <laughs> right? By statute. The statute tells me. Fee simple titles, free of commutation, being are hereby granted to all native tenants who occupy and improve any portion of any government land. Section 2, occupy and improve any, <coughs> land, any land held by the king, king's land, or any chief, Konihiki lands. Right? So here, fee simple titles, free of commutation, are granted to any lands... Pretty much any lands. Government, Konohiki, chiefs. Section 4. That a certain portion of government lands in each island shall be set apart and placed in the hands of special agents to be disposed of in lots from 1 to 50 acres in fee simple to such natives as may not be otherwise furnished with sufficient land. Minimum price, 50 cents per acre. Does this sound like a policy that is trying to dispossess lines of land? No, it's saying if you don't have land, come buy land from the government, 50 cents an acre, lots from 1 to 50 acres. Yeah? This is what uh, Aila Ohana does in Kaena. Uh, nine brothers and sisters write in, say, hey, we don't want our kuleana. We want to buy, because Kaena is all government land, we want to buy 50 acres lots. Nine Aila brothers and sisters, 50 acre lots in Kaena. Gave up their 28,000 acres, so it's not going to show up in that statistic, but... That Ohana got land, 450 acres, 9 times 50, right? But you got to know where to look, right? If you're just looking at the general statistics, hey, we only got 28,000 acres of land. No, 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 no. Go look in other places too. Here's an example. Land Commission Award 4491 to Kuapu, Kanaohe, Again, here you have the survey. Upon a one, upon a two, looks different than the oral gifts, looks different than the... Koneiki Awards. Yeah? Three different kinds of land commission awards. <clears throat> so here we have the 28,000 acre statistic. This is Trump's annual, page 36, I believe 1895 or 1896. Total area of land commission awards, Kuleanas. Land statistics, Puna, Hawaii, 32 acres. Right? The entire island of Oahu fits in Puna. That's how big Puna is. Yeah? Looks like the people of Puna got screwed, right? There's only 32 acres. Right? All of Puna is government land. So where are you going to look to see if Hawaiians got land or not? Fee simple sale of government lands. Yeah? Over 16,000 acres purchased in Puna. But no can. Hawaiians never have money. Hawaiians didn't understand the system. Hawaiians... All of these things. Yeah. <clears throat> so here's where we get the 28,000 acre statistic from. Yeah. The difficulty is this is factually accurate. Hawaiians only got 28,000 acres of land via the Kuleana Act, but Hawaiians got, acre, got land from this, from that, from that, and from that. Right? So Hawaiians got land, just not via this mechanism. But then we don't look for this mechanism because Hawaiians didn't understand, Hawaiians didn't have money. If you didn't have money, you, I'm not going to go look for where you're buying land because you never have money. So then all of these assumptions start to drive what I'm looking for. And I'm not looking for all of those things because this tells me Hawaiians didn't understand. If they didn't understand, they're not going to be buying. The fundamental assumptions we have are wrong, are flawed. Here you see the three land commission awards that add up to the 32 acres. 11 plus 13 plus 7, that's the 32 acres of Kuleana lands. 
So you can clearly see that kulianas are but a subset of all the land commissional works. Right? The 28,000 acres doesn't cover every single land commission award, it only covers one kind of land commission award. The rest of these, Lunalilo, Kamamalu, Kaunaeha, Kanaina, Kamamalu, Lunalilo, all Konihiki awards. Mahele. All of these guys got these lands in the Mahele book. <coughs> That's where all the trust there, you see. This is, yeah, this would be a, <clears throat> where all the trust lands come from, yeah. There's Kekau Nohi there, but that's Panau, different place okay. that we were talking about. Um. This was my master's thesis. I looked at every single sale of government land from uh, 1846 to 1893. Looked at uh, 3,600 columns. Long, 15 columns wide, so what is that? 3,600 times 15, how much, how big that data set is, right? So I can tell you how much land was bought in Pune between 1840 and 1850, how much land was bought in Waianae between 1852 and 1859. Whatever breakdown you want, we can break down, and I did that so I could see who's buying land where. Yeah. Are Hawaiians buying land or are other people buying land? Way too far. Earlier we were looking here, same page, estimates of area and all government grants sold. 667,000 acres, you look at Puna, 32 acres of land commission award, 17,000 acres of fee simple sales. Who's buying this? Hawaiians. But Hawaiians never have money, Hawaiians mm -hmm. never understand. So here we have, this is Royal Patent Grant number one, all the way to 3,600. These five sales here make up more than 50% of all the total acreage. And this is where you have to be careful with statistics. If you're going to look at the general statistics, foreigners bought all the land. This five sales, more than 60% of all the lands. If you're going to look at the trends, Hawaiians bought land. They're just not buying a 180,000 acre cattle ranch, they're buying a 50 acre lot there. A five acre mean? lot, a two acre lot. Say again. The names of those ranches. Samuel Parker, Parker Ranch, Charles Reed Bishop, Kaunakakai Molokai, 24,000 acres. C.C. Harris, Kahuku, Kau, uh, on the Big Island. Mm -hmm. Kahuku, uh, Kahuku Ranch, oh, on the Big Island. And then all of these get complicated, right? Samuel Parker marries Hawaiian. Foreigner buys who inherits? Children. His Hawaiian children. Who benefited from that? The foreigners foreign. or Hawaiians? The foreigners. Hawaiian. If we're going to look the day of the sale, the foreigner. If we're going to look the day after the sale, the Hawaiian who inherited. Right? It's, black, it's not black and white. It's gray. Right? It's not as easy as, oh, foreigners took everything. Well, who inherited? His Hawaiian kids. But if the foreigners do at the same time, they can never be just Hawaiian. They will be For, foreigner. Too. Foreigner used in the 18th, in the kingdom context, place of birth. Native, born in Hawaii, foreigner born someplace else. So if you were born in 1852, there's a court case. Asa Thurston claims to be a native Hawaiian. I would say Asa Thurston was a native Hawaiian. Why? Because he was two parents came to Hawaii, had a child on this soil, native born. Native born gets you citizenship, citizenship, Hawaiian citizen. Native Hawaiian is, I was born on the islands, I'm a Hawaiian subject, not I'm a native Hawaiian today, ethnic brown skin. Two totally different contexts. 1850s, native, place of birth, foreigner, born someplace else. Hawaiian nationality, not ethnicity. Mm -hmm. yeah? And that's the other shift that has we have to make. But not all of them had children. Not all of them, but yeah. Samuel Parker did yeah, in this case. The other one is Ni'ihau, purchase of Ni'ihau. Robinson. Uh, Sinclair's before the Robinson. But there wasn't one lease, or there was fee simple? Uh, the Sinclair's fee simple. All of this is fee simple sale. Royal patent grants are all fee simple sale of government land. So 
So Tanaka, I heard stories of a, a foreigners that they marry Kanaka. Yeah, and but they get their they get their true wife back where they came from. So does that hold water for their marriage? You know? I would have to read the Read, read the laws, because they had marriage laws to protect against that at that time, yeah? and they had marriage laws to protect protect against abandonment, ag ag against those foreigners. Like, you couldn't just leave the country, you had to, any ship captain who took someone who didn't register was liable. Yeah? So they were putting things to get rid of the abandonment issue that was going on. Number of sales, 1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you see Hawaiians out-purchased non-Hawaiians in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s. Population, 80,000, 40,000. The other thing you've got to keep in mind is there's less than 1,000 foreigners in Hawaii until 1870. So we've got to stop making like there was 20,000 of them running the show. We had more guns. Their, their, <laughs> their population doesn't go up until the 1880s, right? In the 1820s, there's only 20 of them. Please don't give 20 missionaries the power to take over 80,000 Hawaiians, right? Like, we have to be careful with what we do. Oh, those missionaries, they were running everything. 20 guys, really? You're telling me Kamehameha couldn't take out 20 guys? Mm -hmm. He took out 20 warriors, he can take out. Right, so we just have to be conscious of what we, how much agency we ascribe these other people, right? We're in Hawaiian Airlines, not American Airlines. 1843, we're a country. We've got to act like it. So there's some missionaries you think? 1820s. Yeah. In 1820s, there's only 30 missionaries. But what is the root, root word of missionaries? <coughs> mission. They were sent here on a mission for the 1893. Ron Williams, 1860, missionary says, we're done. Close shop. Half of those missionaries in the 30s and 40s give up their allegiance to the mission to become surveyors and do other things on this island. Yeah? What we have to separate from is the sons here and the actions of the sons are, are, not, are not the same as the parents. And I don't, you have to look at each of them one by one. But we have this analogy like father, like son, that these guys were doing what their sons were doing. For example, uh, Wilcox, who buys Hanale. Albert Wilcox Jr. buys Hanale. Albert Wilcox Sr. marries a Konohiki, has Hawaiian children. Albert Wilcox Jr. in the 1900s purchases Hanale. Albert Wilcox Jr., sugar, in Hawaiian sugar involved with overthrow stuff, right? Wilcox His father Wilcox. dies when Albert Wilcox Jr. is six months old. How did his father instill in him all of these missionary values and teach his son to have this perspective when six months he died? DNA. <laughs> but, but the better answer is all of these guys are going to school on the East Coast colleges, they're going to Yale, they're going to all the East Coast Ivy League schools who are teaching this racist look out for yourself self-interest mentality during this time. They learn it from somewhere else and bring it back. They're not learning it from their fathers. Most of the missionaries who were here were of this place, were of this aina, were subjects to put themselves under and serve Kamehameha the third. Were they, were they blood Hawaiians? No. Did they serve Hawaiians? Yes. And for us, that's hard today because Everything is ethnic, everything is you damn haole, everything is through the lens of race. we got to get past that so you can see what's going on here. Yeah? Here you have loyalty. I put myself under you. I serve. We don't understand that today. We, don't, we talk about serving, but we don't understand serving today in the way our ancestors served. Yeah? Go read Kamehameha uh, Kiku Haupio and the story of uh, Kamehameha and Keiko Haupio, the chapter on Keiko Haupio. And for that class, Ohana, second. Who is my haku, who am I serving? Keiko Haupio does not go home to his family because he has to take care of And you see that military-like idea of service. You put yourself under, you serving that guy, 
his family did not matter. His family was secondary to his service to his chief. And we don't understand that today because, oh, today we're all equal. America, we're all equal. Right? It's a different, we're brought up in a different mentality. <clears throat> 50 acres of land is the size of land that is most purchased. 84 people bought 50 acres of land. And does that number resonate with anyone? That a certain portion of government lands in each island shall be placed in, and you can buy lots from 1 to 50 acres. Right? So either they were acting on this law and buying 50 acre lots, or it's just a very big coincidence that 50 was everybody's favorite number at that time. Not 49, not 48, not 44, not 22, 50. Yeah? Hawaiians are reading. Hawaiians know what's going on. It's us today who don't understand that they understood. Because everything we learned was after all about you and instilled what they wanted us to learn. Yeah, there's a reason we were, we're bringing us today, right? Samuel Damon, the, in order to have peace and annexation, we must obliterate the past. Yeah. <laughs> they intentionally obliterated history because they understood how important history it was. If you don't connect to your ancestors, if you think, hey, this thing my ancestors did, hey, that's what foreigners did. Mm. Boom, disconnect, not connected. Not connecting yourself to the accomplishments, to their deeds, to all of their things. Disconnect, who am I as a Hawaiian? Now we all got identity crisis because we cannot connect to anything. Because our ancestors, oh, Kalakaua, he was a drunk, he was the married monarch. Oh, Kamehameha III, he was a drunk. He let the missionaries give us private property. How does that affect our identity? Right. If it's true, that's one thing. Right? But I don't see the Mahale as a missionary in position because you're giving us way too much rights. They didn't do that. I'm a geographer. I study land and how colonization happens, how private property happens. This doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. But nowhere else in the world is an independent state in 1843. We're driving the bus, and that's what makes our history different, not better, different than our Maori cousins, than our Native American cousins, than all of our indigenous cousins. We got an airplane to fly in 1843, which means we got to be in charge of how and what we did with that airplane, that country. <clears throat> Resolved that the life estate of Lewis Graver in Palkawila expired by his decease. Palkawila, 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 Palkawila. Hawaiian names, Hawaiian names. Two acres, three acres, eight acres, two acres, two acres. That 615 acres gets sold to natives. Yeah. That's not going to show up in the 28,000 acre statistic. That's going to show up in the fee simple sale of government lands. Puna Hawaii. 1890, this is 1893. Hawaiians, before 1893, purchased 79% of all acreage, 13,000 of 16,000 acres, purchased by Hawaiians. Uh, <clears throat> there's a book that came out, Naku Aina, talks about the story of Puna. does not talk about the 13,000 acres of land that are, are bought. focuses on all of the other stuff. Oh, there's only three acres, there's only two, 32 acres does not discuss this statistic. Post 1893, Hawaiians purchased 8%. There's the Huli. Before the overthrow, 80. Post overthrow, 8. Right? Hawaiians, this purchase here is in Ola'a. Not a single acre of Ola'a was purchased before 1895. Why? Crown lands. Crown lands, inalienable, cannot purchase crown lands. That's why you could not have bought Ola in 1865. 1894, confiscate the crown lands. Now they're selling the crown lands. Right? You could not have sold Ola if you did not overthrow the government, if you did not make an 1894 constitution that confiscated the crown lands and said what was once public is now private, and then made the 1895 Land Act, which then made the laws and made these things now what was inalienable, alienable. The Huli is the overthrow. Yeah. The Huli is the overthrow. And this is where you'll see all of your landed uh, <coughs> names, Peck, Trovich, Shikake, Shipman, 
all of this. 1897. Right? You have said in a, another presentation that um, mm -hmm. the, the percentages of Hawaiian and non-Hawaiian that's buying land is is based on just looking at the name, right? Yeah. So there, so there, that percentage could possibly be higher, right? If you if people have non-Hawaiian names but actually are Hawaiian, you have to do the genealogy, right? Yeah, I would have you to, have to do like a whole lot more. Right? I'd have to do the genealogy for the entire what could be? Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, I'd have to do 3,600 genealogies. I can't even do my one. Yeah. It's my a long presentation. No, that's, that's 3,600 other descendants. Let's all get together and, and contribute one by one. Cause I don't need to be that precise in my answer for who's buying land. Yeah. Question. Yeah, what about the belief that all um, all of these things would become null and void in the end with the reiteration of the Hawaiian Kingdom that all of these, these all of these different titles, anything still lingering would be null and void. How do you feel about that? Save that one for the end, because that one can take me ten or fifteen okay. minutes. <laughs> yeah. let, let me get through this because I'm almost out of time. And the security guard is going to start walking back and forth. And when we're going, he's supposed to be out of here at 9. <clears throat> Land Act of 1895. In order to develop a citizenship here that will be always improving in those characteristics which are recognized as the highest attributes of American citizenship, it is essential that the class referred to as Anglo-Saxon should be largely increased, and particularly that it should be increased by the introduction of persons from the mainland. What? Anglo-Saxon? Americans. We need Americans from America to come here because when a, Jap when a Japanese person who came for the plantations marries, has a child, that child is now a Hawaiian national. That Hawaiian national now has voting rights. That Chinese who is parent who has a child. Sanford Dole knows that the Anglo-Saxons, the whites, are going to lose the demographic vote to the Japanese and to the Chinese. Hawaiian population, boom. Japanese Chinese population, Filipino population, boom. Why? Because all the plantations for sugar are bringing in these immigrants. They're having children, birth on the soil, they're all Hawaiians. Hawaiians, right to vote, right to vote, going to outnumber the whites. We're not going to be able to pass the laws we want to pass. So Sanford Dole encourages immigration from America to offset the vote, offset the demographic vote. His words, not mine. Wow. <coughs> yeah. As of yet, little has been done in the way of introducing Americans from the mainland to these islands, although the preparation of the Act of 1895 was distinctly made with that object in view. Yeah. He tells us why. What's the purpose of the 1895 Land Act? Encourage <coughs> immigration from, specific immigration, American yes. immigration. Mm -hmm. <coughs> If you want to put this in the context of international law, war crime. You can't flood the population with immigrants from the occupied country. It's all white. Right? Halilea. We don't have the pre and post. Prior to 1893, 36 sales, 100 acres. Post-1893, 12 acres. You don't have that big because there's not a lot of government lands on Kauai. Yeah. What you do have is the fee simple sale of crown lands on Ahola and Hanalei. Yeah. Crown lands could not have been bought under the kingdom. Inalienable. Mm -hmm. Made alienable after the overthrow, after the 1894 constitution, after the 1895 land act. <coughs> land patent ran 4845 to Abu Wilcox Jr. This is where they get Hanalei. After their 30 year lease, do the math, 1865, crown lands are <coughs> 30 years later, 1905, we need to be able to purchase lands that aren't purchasable. How do we do that? Overthrow the government, become the government, sell the lands to ourselves, make a law, sell the lands to ourselves. Right? And right here. And in conformity with Section 17 of Part 4 of the Land Act of 1895. I could not have done this without the Land Act of 1895. I love Hawaiian history. I don't have to interpret anything. It's all there for us, right? I don't have to <coughs> interrupt anything. They, they tell us what they're doing. Why does any of this matter? Right? 
The Makai Nana ultimately received some 8,200 awards on the basis of the Kuleana Act. Several reasons may account for this low figure. This is my, you gotta break the shackles. Mm. I'm blood for the matrix. First reason, why, why did we only get 28,000 acres of Kuleana lands? Well, Hawaiians were unfamiliar with writing and unfamiliar with written law. Literacy rates were high 90%. Hundreds of Hawaiian language newspapers. Newspapers, bilingual, Hawaiian and English, not only English. How are we unfamiliar with writing when you have a hundred plus Hawaiian language newspapers? Right? Hawaiians, we didn't have money. <coughs> no cash. We didn't want to evolve. We wanted to, I think today we don't want to evolve. Back then, the argument was no, they wanted to stay in tradition. They didn't want to break away from the old system. No? They were scared of reprimand, reprisal from the Konohikis. That one has some truth because there were some Konohikis who weren't letting the, <coughs> the Hawaiians. This is the important part. No sufficiently conclusive study of the agrarian turmoil of the time has been published to date. In the meantime, some scholars have suggested some of the reasons listed here for the low counts of awards. Suggested. This is not a truth. This is a hypothesis. Today, this hypothesis is truth. Nobody's writing suggested. People are writing Hawaiians didn't have money. Hawaiians didn't understand. Yeah. This is in 1989. This is my Von Lam, Kuleana Act Revisited. Clear. If you do your scholarly duty and follow footnotes and read her footnotes, this is in her footnote. She says this is suggested, not truth. Suggested. But today, it's a truth. Hawaiians didn't own land, Hawaiians didn't understand, Hawaiians didn't have money. Nobody ever did a study to show Hawaiians didn't have money. Nobody ever did a study to show Hawaiians didn't understand the process. All of that is explanations. These are the four, five, six reasons given to why this 28,000 acre statistic is so small. Why did we only get 8,200 acres of land? Well, it's because we were buying it and we were doing these other 10 things, but instead, Suggestions have become <coughs> truths. Right? If that right there is not enough to convince you, I don't know what else I can do. This was a suggestion. This isn't a truth. Nobody ever proved this true. But we want to believe it to be true. Right? Don't, build, <coughs> don't build your house on the sand. Build your house on rock. This is just my fun, playful. I've been talking for two hours. You gotta let me have some fun, right? Mm -hmm. I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more only if they knew they were slaves, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We gotta break our own shackles. <coughs> we gotta look at our own history. We gotta challenge our own assumptions. Mm -hmm. How do I know what I know? <coughs> because for a hundred years, people have been telling in purposeful lies and then we haven't had access to information and all kinds of other things, right? <coughs> but ultimately, right, Bob Marley, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. <coughs> I got eight minutes before. <laughs> I drove an hour and a half to get here. I'm going to talk for this evening. <laughs> William Little Lee, January 14th, 1848. I agree with you that the subject of prolonging the time for sending in land claims is worthy of serious consideration, and I will take the first opportunity to bring it before the king. The tenants, however, will not lose their rights should they fail to send in their claims. Oh, that's yeah. Should the tenants neglect to send in their claims, they will not lose their rights if their Konohikis present title, present claims. For no title will be granted to the Konohikis without a clause reserving the rights of native tenants. No. This tells me native tenants' rights still exist today. No. How are you going to get the American courts, state of Hawaii courts, to recognize that today is a whole other story. Yeah? But we got rights. Don't they un uh, operate under the Hawaiian Kingdom law? 
they've selectively brought in, if you go back to the Kulayana Act, the only, the only section of the Kulayana Act they've brought forward is Section 7. You have the right to tea leaf, ahu cord, thatch. You have the right, you have gathering rights. Not you have rights to your undivided interest that was given to you in 1840 as ownership of all of the real property in Hawaii. You have tea leaf. And that's that statistic of 1840, the whole bundle of sticks is ours. State of Hawaii interpretation, you have one bundle of stick that says you can go gather. Just be fearless. If you understand the mahele is yours, you understand the whole bundle of sticks is yours. If you understand that the mahele is a foreign imposition and somebody else gave it to us, then you probably think we can gather tea leaf. So with all of you guys, Kiamusa, yourself, with all of the knowledge that you folks got from sharing with us and all, everybody else, why isn't there a precedent that overrules what the state does with all the knowledge you learned from a state university, <coughs> which is funded from the Queen? So without sharing with all of us, is this together, the numbers to come up together as one? to stand up for our right for you just giving us a lot of hope. For for me step one step one is hope. For me it's understanding that your ancestors did something positive for you and not something negative. If you're past that and you I'm conservative. Right? Pe people in this room aren't going to like me because I'm conservative. People are losing land. Donovan, what are you doing for the people? But I don't want to win battles. I want to win the war. And I see people distorting principles in order to win battles and get their land back and distort what I feel is proper pono interpretations of our law, which will then make it harder to win the war. The, the example being the uh, yeah. royal patent grants. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a distortion. I don't. I think people are trying to make up for a hundred years of occupation, not trying to interpret things in the proper perspective. perspective. Yeah. So for me, if I get a feeling that people are short-sighted, I here's the information. You can go do this on your own, but don't ask me to be an expert witness. Don't That's ask me to be, ask don't ask me. But I, I also don't have my PhD, so I'm not qualified to speak in court, right? Uh, you're qualified. <laughs> but you did your thesis already, right? Yeah? Masters, I have my masters. Was it um, approved and did you pass? Oh, yes, yeah. So that, that should hold water, water oh, if you depend on the court. If you're the state of Hawaii, you're gonna let me come testify? <laughs> but if you get a whole bus, the whole lot will be behind you. Yeah, no. They'll go through there. But, but, but the reason why I ask you for bringing you up because they take, they'll take my wife as an one witness for an accident. Why can I take you for an accident that was created back then as a witness? <coughs> because this accident costs a million dollars per house lot, right? This is all land title in Hawaii is. Who stands to lose the most? Them, yeah. Who stands to gain the most? Us. The yeah. But that's why they're not going to let us bring this up in court. But that's where society lost track, where the people know more the power and the government did everything. So we got the rights. So we got rights together. Unity of First, we, we got to understand. This is ours. Yo. Right? And then once we're past that, once we understand this is ours, then we can talk step two, step three. But I know, you don't know how long, oh man, you don't know how many Hawaiians believe the old narrative. And I gotta fight our own people yeah. to, they don't even, they don't wanna see. They don't, for, for one, I don't think they understand that I'm saying, hey, this, we have something to gain from this by saying that the Mahele was done by us, not by them, yeah. right? But there's so much layers that you gotta get through that <coughs> we cannot even get there. <coughs> to wear. And the thing is because, you know, we all come from a generational hurt that no one trusts, eh? Yep. Everybody, you know, all our kind of, because we're walking on eggshells and when we hear something, you know, that is not, that we don't really believe in, but we have, yeah, we need to take that time to do our due diligence and research, and we end up freaking um, 
you know, adhering to that narrative, you know. If we get deoccupied to tomorrow, we're quite honestly not ready in terms of land to start that transition. Who else understands land? There's three people, five people in Hawaii that understand this perspective, right? Who, who else can come and give you this pres presentation? Keanu? Come on a beamer, maybe? Right? Like, we, we don't have... In 1840, 1848, around the Mahele, all of, all of the people were sending in petitions saying, Hey, King Kamehameha III, we don't want any more foreigners in government. His response was, Foreigners are in government because I don't have trained Hawaiians. So my question for us today in 2018, do we have trained Hawaiians? Right? So for me, we gotta, we got to answer that question first. Let's get the trained Hawaiians so when it flips, we got 10, 20 people, not three. We got 20 people who we... This thing is complicated. It's not simple. Right? You don't want one guy in charge of all of the land. To interpret everything, we gotta have twenty guys. Hey, no, what about this? Hey, but I read this. I, I cannot read everything, right? So we need twenty people. We don't have twenty people right now, or fifty people, whatever it is, right? But for me, we need. That's where the education is the most important. Before we start playing with the hand grenade, learn how to take apart the gun before you shoot yourself in the foot, right? We all want to mobilize this and hey, let me use this tool and go. Okay, but I'm conservative. I don't want you shooting yourself in the foot. I don't want you shooting somebody else in the foot. Right? But that's me. You go find somebody else, maybe they will push this faster, harder. So you're saying as a descendant, go after Royal Captain and Kuli on the lands, or leave it alone and let it go and let it be like Coco Palms? That, 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 it, that is for each individual and each family to decide for themselves. That, that's, that's not, uh, it's not my place to tell other people what to do. It's not my land. It's not my family. Not my, and I don't mean that as a cop out. It's just it's not, it's not mine. I cannot tell you what to do with your land. It's not you. Yeah? You heard this. You know. Like, like the couple palms, the descendants over there that are having trouble and um, you know, up against foreign investors, do we let them do it on their own? I mean, they're kind of, you know, they're young kiai, a lot of them. Or do we back them up and, and help them? Yeah. Anyone who's not distorting principles, I will help. If, if I feel people are distorting, that's, I, I don't want to have to undo stuff 30 years from now. That, because we're coming from a place of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Right? Like we all want to move, but who can explain this? Why are we moving if nobody in the room can explain this? How are we going to court and mobilizing if, if we don't have the foundation? What are we doing? So will this be part of the... Honor? But that's me. That's only me. That, that's not truth for everybody. You disagree with me, you disagree. Right? But then you go learn this and, and, and go push. So would this be part of the unraveling of the illegal overthrow with Keanu as a, as a particular uh, Yeah, I mean, as a solid packet to bring forth against the U.S. And a big state. Yeah. So uh, what I want to say is, um, would it be better if we go get the Hawaiian kingdom back first, then this, or would it be better to be together? Shall I rescue you? you? <laughs> <laughs> the, Sit down again. Let me, let me, wait, stop. So one of the things that we're doing here, and I think Danny can explain it before we end tonight because it's 9 o'clock. We started doing a series of these kinds of presentations, new research coming out of UH Manoa and wherever that has to do with Hawaiian history so people have a better understanding of what we're up against. I'm happy to hear this. not the first time I've heard it. Well, I don't recall remembering all of that stuff that you said tonight. A lot of this stuff, we, you know, I added a lot of new slides to this one. We're going to be having to be exposed to this stuff a mm. lot. Mm. A lot. And not just us, but everybody. Mm. Anybody who's interested in Hawaiian history, 
You gotta learn it. I think I know everything, but you know, I don't know anything either. And I'm trying to teach it. And so, there's a lot more to do. One of the benefits of having having Donovan come, and Keanu, and Ron Williams, and whoever, is that we want this community on this side to learn about stuff that you're learning up at the University of Hawaii because nobody wants to go up there, thank you. I don't want to go up there. So next semester, we're going to be doing another set of people coming in. Hopefully, you'll come and talk about the stuff you didn't talk about today. We can do prom lands. Yeah, so we'll do prom lands like next semester Yay. because we know nothing. And even if we sit through it, we still know nothing. Right. I'm going to go home thinking, I'm glad we're live streaming mm -hmm. because I got to go back and look at what we live stream. Yeah. So I think all the questions that are coming out are really good. I don't think we're ready to move on anything yet because nothing we know enough. Yeah. We, we know a little. Yeah. And better to know more before we make <coughs> any kind of major errors. All of us saying, well, what are the priorities? Are you going to go after the Kingdom of Hawaii? Or this first? Or both together? What's the... When it flips, I want us to be prepared on the land side. I want us to understand, let us be able to describe how land transitioned pre-overthrow. Right now, what book, what book do we read to, that tells that? It's not written yet, right? So we need, I see my kuleana is building that, that foundation. And so that when it flips, we're prepared. Basically, you want us to go and do more research on our own yeah. so we can learn more and we can better understand this so that when the flip doesn't happen, there are more people that understand it the way it should be understood. For, for me, I'm my metaphor that I would use for this, I, I don't. And this is just my personal perspective. I don't, I'm not a builder of armies. I don't think we need an army. An army did not overthrow Hawaii in 1893. 13 guys. So why do I think I need 30,000 people to agree in 2018 when it only took 13 guys in 1893? Right? So I'm more special forces. Right? Like, I don't. I don't necessarily think we need all 200,000 Hawaiians to agree. That's just me. All 80,000 Hawaiians or people in Hawaii didn't agree in 1893. It flipped. Right? There was no consensus. There was no buy-in. So for me, for it to flip back, I don't... That's just me. That's my... How I think. Right? I might be wrong. Maybe we do need everybody to, to, to agree. <coughs> Um, what I would say to that, though, is let the fishermen fish, let the pig hunters hunt, let the, whatever you do, do. Yeah. Be the best. I'm not telling everybody in this room you got to be a land guy. If you're a land guy, be the best land guy. <coughs> but I'm not telling you you got to be a land guy because you be you. Whatever you is, you be you. And let the hula guys be the hula guys, let the land guys be the land guys, let just be you. You know, we, I, I think we put too much pressure on our, on society. We gotta be everything. You gotta be at the Mauna, you gotta be here, you gotta be there. Exhausted, no can. Whatever you do, do it well. Be the best. You know, then we have competence everywhere. Then we got, yeah. then yeah. when it's time, hey, who's, who, who's the hula guy? Boom. Hey, who's the land guy? Boom. Hey, who's the... Nationality guy, boom. Hey, who's the religion guy? Boom. They have plenty of problems. <laughs> not big land. Mm -hmm. Right? And if that's not your thing, that's not your thing. You know, so it's I think we gotta Kuleana is also knowing what is not yours. Not everything is your responsibility. It's also knowing what is not your responsibility. Because then you can be effective. Mm -hmm. Right? If you spread thin, you're not doing nothing for nobody. Yeah. You spread too thin. Not doing nothing. Say no to something, say no to something, so whatever you do, do it well. Then you're an asset, not a liability. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right? That's my, that's my, my monopoly. Thank you. Danny, you want to come up? 
and talk a little bit about why we do this stuff and <coughs> what can be expected for the future. Yeah, one of the things, I've been uh, the coordinator now for, I don't know, maybe two or three, two or three years, mm -hmm. uh, full time. And uh, my idea is that college needs to be a uh, part of the community. And we want to be responsive. Okay, and so she came up with the idea of, uh, can we do talks? I was like, sure, all right? Because the better educated people are, the better they understand what's going on, the better decisions they can make. It's really simple for me, okay? So I can open up the, open up here until 10 o'clock or something like that, right? We can continue to do this, we have to continue to do this, right? Because the more people know, the better off they are, yeah. and the better decisions they can make. So it's real simple Thank that you. way. Thank you, Danny. But it would not hurt if you wanted to register for a class. <laughs> <laughs> our, our job is education, right? When you walk through, you'll see our, we call it our wall of fame. Those are 14 people that started here and are completing uh, their education now. One of, the, uh, one of my favorite um, <clears throat> pictures that isn't there is Cody Costa. Is anybody familiar with Cody? He had a horrific um, burning, he was severely burned when he was a child, right? He's graduating this year. Uh, we've got a uh, uh, mother and daughter team group that also graduate, right? So we're providing a very valuable service to the community, right? But the idea is, right, they start here and keep on going, right? whether it's KCC, UH, or wherever else, right? But the bottom line is, right, the better educated people are, the better decisions they make. And uh, as I like to point out, right, I've traveled to 45 different countries. The more options you have, right, and the more options they have, the ha hopefully the happier you're going to be and the more successful. Just let me end with a quick one. This is you, right? We're all waiting for this. We're all waiting for that leader to emerge, right? Where is, we're not united, where's the leader? Where's, we need, we need that. Right? Leaders need followers, right? And what we don't know how to do today is follow, right? And I'm not talking blind follow, but I'm talking, hey, you find something, go support. Yeah. Right? But we're all waiting for this. You don't control this. You don't control what other people do. You don't control if some leader emerges from our community. You do have control over you. You can either do that or you can do that. Mm -hmm. But if you're sitting here waiting for a leader to emerge, mm -hmm. You control that. Do one of the two. Right? But if you stay here, where's the leader? Where? Oh, how come we cannot unite? Right? You can do this. That's the other half of leadership, right? We're all waiting for the leader to step up. Well, go follow somebody. And I hope I'm going to get blown up on YouTube, on, on Facebook now for that one. I'm not saying go follow, and I'm not trying to anybody to sign up for me. Or sign up for anything. There's no, there's no sovereignty group to sign up for. This is a theor meta metaphorical, well waiting for somebody else to do something. Thank you for sharing. You can do this. You can do that. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> um, yeah.